Wagwan G's, welcome back to the Agostino English Show, episode number 93 with me, your host, Agostino. What's good? What's going on? How's life? Hope you guys are well. Hope you're nice and chilled out and relaxed. I'm feeling good, man. Bish, bosh, bash, start of the new week. Monday morning, coming at you hot. Live from Stratford, or Maryland to be precise, bruv. How are you guys doing? I think you're doing good. I think you're doing okay. And I'm proud about it. God damn it. The weather feels nice this morning. It feels fucking lovely. Absolutely lovely for once. It's cooled down. The temperatures are nice and cool. We're feeling, we're in like a nice little period of summer in London now. We're not boiling like we're in the flipping middle of the Caribbean, which is weird, isn't it? Like, you know, if you know anything about London, then you know that we, would, we, we haven't been blessed with the best of summers um, the last few years or the best weather in general over the last t- decade. And um, we have this tendency in England to kind of moan about everything, right? We, we could love, love a good complaint, but some of our complaints have a lot of merit towards it. Do you know what I mean? Like the fact that, you know, we don't have clubs that are open after 3 a.m. The fact that we have pubs that serve you uh, pints in warm glasses. Um, the fact that there's no real good uh, Korean barbecue places for the most part. If you know of any, give me a suggestion link below. Um, the fact that the central line doesn't have air conditioning. There's things that we complain about that have some merit, right? But some things that we complain about just goes to show how much we like to moan, right? We're complaining about the weather, right? The weather in London has always been, or in England has always been shit, especially when it comes to summer, because you realize there's shit because you go to like a tiny country somewhere in Europe, you go to Prague in Czech Republic, right? Or you go to Lisbon in Portugal or something. You go to a random country in Europe for a weekend and it'll be the best weather you've ever had, right? That whole summer for a weekend that you go away or for the week you go away. And you come back to England, and by default, I think every time I've come back from a holiday from somewhere that I've visited around the world, and I've come back into Heathrow, Stansted, or Gatwick, most of the time, I think 8 out of 10 of the times, it's been raining. Or it's been fucking really muggy, right? Or it's been really foggy, and it's like a big slap in the face, like, Welcome back to London. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Get out of your fucking holiday funk. Not all of us are fortunate enough to go on holiday in the middle of, I don't know, August or November or all that sort of malarkey. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's never, it never really works out in that way. So that's interesting. But apart from that, it's been a good old time. Um, it's been a great weekend for me. Um, you know, for me, the weekend is, is a time where I can um, possess, you know, and think about the things I want to do. You know, sound like a manager for me. Now, the weekend was fucking awesome, to be honest. Um, I had a bit of a health complication on the Friday. Um, I ended up shitting my pants because of stuff that I ate, which wasn't the best thing in general. And then when I ended up shitting my pants, I realized I didn't have any tissue paper, which is horrible, isn't it? Because I ran into the toilet. You know when you run into the toilet in the morning and you run in without opening the light because you're that you're fucking, you're about to explode. Everything's going to come out of every orifice in your body. Some of it's going to leak out, right? So you just run into the toilet. You, you, you hastily close it or you try to close it. You sit down and you realize, fuck, the toilet seat's not down. You've got that fucking wet ring or that kind of, you know, residue of the of the loo ring. So you're like, Ugh, disgusting. So you get up again. You sit down again on the toilet seat. You you start you start shitting and it's like, and it's, like it's like a fucking hose, isn't it? It's just like shit just coming out of your fucking finger. And it hurts so much because some of it has to do with, you know, maybe some spicy stuff you ate. Some of it has to do with maybe um, it's irritating your rectum. Especially the outer rim. So you just you're just in absolute pain. You know what I mean? You just cannot handle it. Then you start to think what well, I don't know how, again, I don't know how they do it. People are like anal bruv. I don't know how you guys like that sort of shit, but when you shit really hard, it, the, 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 there are times where you can shit really hard and you there is a slight bit of pleasure, right? You're like, oh my god, that feels amazing, right? But I think it's less about the feeling of the shit coming out of your arsehole and more so about the relief that you've got this thing out of your body. I think for the most part. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's some scientific proof behind it that proves. Oh, no, I guess, you know, actually, the pleasure you're getting is from the shit passing through your rectum. And that's the same way how people that like anal um, get stimulated. But I'm like, Meh, I'm going to have to pass on that one. I don't think that's true. And I don't want to try. <laughs> so, um, yeah, um, you get that weird relief. And then and then because um, in my bathroom, unfortunately, we've got but we have a bathroom that's kind of weird, right? Where the. The loo kind of like is against a wall, but there's no right angle next to it, right? Because most, if you think about it, most toilets have a kind of wall that's on a right angle next to it. Whether it's here, whether it's there, there's some sort of like wall on the right angle. So then you can stick your loo roll thing. We don't have one. 
So even if you did have a lure off thing, you'd have to put it behind you. And it's not ergonomically, it's a bit weird to kind of like go like that, innit? So you'd have to have something that kind of whips out. Yeah, maybe you might have to buy that. Maybe you have to buy, you know, those, you know, when you go to a disabled toilet and they've got that kind of uh, safety bar that kind of whips out like that. Or the kind of like, you know, an armrest in, um, you know, when you go in the airplane and um, you've got uh, you've got a seat next to the exit and it, ha- and it hasn't got a, a seat in front of you that's close to have a table. So your table comes out of your armrest. It kind of comes over that and it folds over. Maybe we might need one of those toilet roll things, um, but we don't have one in our toilet. So we put the toilet roll on top of back of the on top of the flipping um, tank, is it tank? I don't know what that thing called, where all the water is, you press the flush rate. So I'm fucking shitting my ass out, right? Leaking everywhere, in pain, before I was going to go to work. I had to call in sick, because I was just like, I mean, I wasn't feeling too funny. So I was just like in bed, withering and shaking and shit. And then um, I was checking to see where the toilet roll was. I was trying to reach around the back, see where it was. I couldn't find it, couldn't find it. And I kept reaching, and I kept tapping in the back, and I realised, oh my God, I don't have any toilet roll. And sometimes when you when you have a shit right, especially when you have a dry shit, it's fine not to have toilet roll because you can kind of kind of get up and walk around and find a loo roll and then go back in the toilet. But when you don't have any and your bum is leaking, that kind of feeling of residue inside your ass, you're like, oh my god. So I kind of have to get up slowly, squeeze my cheeks together, and then luckily I had some uh, kitchen loo, kitchen uh, kitchen roll that I used to wipe my bum, which isn't the best because it's quite coarse, of course, because you know most of the time you're using it to. It's like a napkin, so when you after you eat, so you can get all the little crumbs off your mouth and stuff. So it's quite coarse, and it doesn't really it doesn't really work that well on your ass and shit. But you know, I got the job done. Had to use quite a bit of it. You know, the whole thing was I like, just covered in, <laughs> in fucking shit. I know, I know. This podcast isn't starting off the best, and I'm talking about brown stains and my fucking asshole. But you did ask how my weekend was going, and I'm telling you, this was part of my weekend. So anyway, I ended up lying in bed for like the. The next eight hours or so, had to, had some tablets, tried to drink loads of liquids and trying to get acclimatized because unfortunately I had to DJ. Or fortunately, unfortunately, I had to DJ that that um that weekend and I couldn't cancel, right? Um, so I had to not go into work. I had to call in sick for work because I was really feeling bad and I had to stay in bed just like covered up in fucking duvets, shivering, thinking I had some sort of pneumonia. I was kind of thinking I was gonna go to hospital at four or four p.m. But then I kind of got a little bit better. I just kept drinking water, and then by the time I got to the bar to DJ um, at Tap East, I was uh, feeling a lot better. But then it just, you, you know, when you're sick and you can power through something, and then as soon as I got back home, I started throwing up again. So I wasn't feeling that great, I gotta be honest. Um, and that was kind of the majority of my weekend. And then the Saturday was spent kind of st- staying at home, you know, licking my wounds, trying to get a bit better. And then Sunday was spent doing exactly the same thing, reading books and just relaxing at home. But it was a pretty brutal Friday, man. I don't wish that on anyone. Not even my worst enemy. But yeah, apart from that, that was that was brutal. But the other side of the of the night was quite good. DJing was fucking sick. I, cl- I think I mentioned it a few times, right? Playing regularly every weekend, you do. Um, it's obvious that you're gonna get better, right? But it's um, um, technically you get better, but it's also that kind of. Uh, the referencing, like I'm able to pluck stuff in my head a lot better. Do you know what I mean? Like I'm not even, I tried not, because I have to use my controller at this bar because they don't have a, a CDJs or anything. I have to just take my whole controller, my laptop with me. I try not to look at my laptop. Over, I try not to overly look at my laptop anyway in general, right? I try to be a little bit uh, cognitive that <coughs> it just looks a bit shit when the DJ's playing. He's got a laptop in front of him. Do you know what I mean? <coughs> <coughs> oh, sorry. Jesus Christ. It looks a bit shit. The DJ's playing with a controller. And he's got his DJ fucking his laptop right in front of him, right? So um, I purposely kind of put it to the side of where I'm playing. So it's kind of on this end so I can kind of play like that. And I usually kind of took the screen a bit forward so I'm not all overly kind of staring at it. And plus, anyway, before I do play, which is different to the era, because I've been DJing a long time, right? But I'd say I've got I've gotten to like a semi-professional where you're kind of getting... I say semi-professional because you're getting paid, right? Um, amateurs when you know it's just not getting paid just doing it for free but i've reached the kind of same pressure level maybe in the last i don't know two to three years and most of it has been a consequence of um i think the reason why i've been getting better or be getting booked again in places more more often is because i'm preparing playlists beforehand now this might seem a bit crazy to some people but when you're playing with a controller you can sometimes get caught in a lazy trap of just taking control and just playing what you got on itunes right but if you know anyone who's a DJ or you know anyone that is into music, you've probably got a lot of songs on your laptop. I've got probably over 3,000, right? Maybe maybe it's close to 5,000 at the moment. So imagine trying to pluck a set. Imagine trying to start playing a set in a club with 3,000 songs. Just like that. Just Okay, just start. 
that's not a good idea. So what I do is I, I usually frame my sets. I have like a starting point, a middle and an end of kind of where I want to go. But then I can kind of ve- I can kind of veer off. So I have like I have like tracks I put into my playlist that um, give me a cue to like, OK, now judge what the climate is saying and you can kind of go down this way. You can kind of go down a reggae way, kind of go down a jazz way, kind of go down a new funk way. Do you know what I mean? You can kind of go down different ways. And that's what I kind of do now. And it really, really helps um, <clears throat> to make the set a bit concise, make it a bit tighter um, and just make it fun. You know what I mean, that's essentially what you want to do, because like I mentioned previously, like tapis isn't fabric. You know what I mean, it's not like a banging nightclub, but there's 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 paying customers in there who kind of want to have a beer and not get annoyed by the music. That's just what I want to do, right? I just don't want to annoy anyone by playing music that I'm playing. So I kind of, um, I don't play to the crowd, but I do play to the crowd in that respect, right? So I, I, I'm always trying to be cognitive of like displaying my own personality. I don't want to stand there and sound like a jukebox. You know what I mean? People be like, this guy doesn't like this sort of shit. So I want to play what I like. You know what I mean? So that's my major, um, that's the thing that I've been kind of trying to focus on a lot more so, trying to get a lot of the things that I like in there, sipping in some new current stuff, sipping in some oldies that no one probably noticed, um, and that's usually my MO for the most part, but it's been fun, man, it's been fun, I can't lie to you, like, I've been having a lot of fun playing, um, it's been fun also, just to kind of see people's reactions to stuff, I'm still having to get used to people saying good job and well done, it's, I feel kind of cringy still, it's not something that I'm really good with at the moment, um, I don't know, I just like, I just hate praise, you know? Like, I think it's a praise thing. Um, maybe because I've just grown up in a house where you just get on with things, you don't wait for pats on the back, right? Um, when we did good things, my dad never, sat, or my mom never sat down and she was, like, really proud of us. You just had to get on with it, do you know what I mean? You just did shit. Just do, just do the right thing and don't look for recognition, do you know what I mean? Just do it. Um, so that's probably why. Um, there might be a... A lack, there might be like a bit of an imposter syndrome thing going on there too also. Maybe I kind of feel like I don't, I shouldn't be there. So when someone says something good, it kind of uh, brings, it kind of, um, it kind of reminds me that I'm actually there. Do you know what I mean? That kind of idea. Maybe that imposter syndrome exists. And just maybe I'm just not comfortable with taking compliments just yet. Do you know what I mean? It's not something that's natural, that comes natural to me at the moment, which, you know, a lot of people probably might not understand. It might seem a bit funny. Oh, I don't know if people say nice job to me, but... I just don't like it. Same way how I don't like when people come out and see me play. Oh, I'm going to come and see you DJ. Like, n- please don't. Do you know what I mean? Just just stay home. Um, or go somewhere else. Do you know what I mean? Allow it. Um, but then by the most, but on the same token, I've also got weird fantasies because I've got chips on my shoulders and I've got fucking revenge tatted on my fucking heart where I just can't wait to play somewhere really bait where a lot of naysayers, a lot of people that said no to me or a lot of people that were overlooking me or a lot of people that were going on like they were better when they weren't. I'm going to be in attendance. I'm going to be playing a set and they're going to look over the DJ booth and see my fucking massive head and I'll be like, oh my God, it's Agostino. And I'll be like, yeah, motherfucker, it's me. It's me. Okay? Um, so I've got that weird fantasy in my head, but in general, I don't really like when people come see me. I just, I just, it's just really cringe. I can't, remember the last, I can't remember the last time I asked someone to come see me DJ, actually. Actually, it might have been recently. I, don't, I can't remember, honestly. But again, it goes back to the not asking people for things, isn't it? A lot of people are like that. I don't think I'm special in that regard. I just, you know, you don't want to ask because you don't want to be vulnerable. You don't want to be, you don't want to open yourself up to the opportunity of somebody saying no, usually. And that's why people don't ask things. So like, are they afraid of someone saying no? And you don't want to feel like you've been rejected. But there are also some people in the world who are just fucking relentless with the requests, isn't it? Like relentless. Like just ask all the time. Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. Just always fucking hands out. It's like, fuck you. That's probably the best. That's probably the biggest turnoff with, with adults, isn't it? Especially with adult males, right? I think that's probably might be the, my biggest turnoff in general. Like for a man to come up to you and just be consistently asking you for things. It's just like, oh, do you have to do that? How do you do this? Where do you go to there? Blah blah. blah. It's like my G. Like there's Google, you know. Like you can find stuff out yourself. Like figure it out, brother. You know what I mean? Like Ralph uh, Waldo Emerson, bro. Self reliance. Like what the fuck is going on here? Like weird. Like lack of accountability in that regard. But. I don't know. Who knows? Who cares? Anyway, onto the onto the topics of the day because I think we need to get straight into it because I've only got an hour to kick onto these subjects, man. Let's go. Episode number ninety three, Action Singer Show. Let's go. So, uh, topic number one to get into. Um, I want to wish Aubrey Marcus a speedy recovery. Um, I saw on the interwebs the other day that he was involved in some sort of accident. Um, so I'm hoping that he makes a speedy, speedy recovery. If you don't know Aubrey Marcus, he's the founder of Onnit. That's about O N N I T. One of the 
uh, famous um, Joe Rogan Experience uh, sponsors. Um, they're actually our business partners in on it as well. And he runs on it Academy, and he's also got supplements, supplements on it Academy, loads of all that kind of stuff, um, and just generally a good egg in it. He gets a bit. He gets a bit of a bad rap on social media on the internet because people think he's a bit of a trust fund kid. People have a weird. Hmm. People on the internet have a very weird dislike for people who come from wealth and try to um, act like they haven't come from wealth. Right? There's a weird not act like it, but when people come from wealth but just want to be regular, people on the internet have a real problem with that. I don't know. I don't really know why. It's strange, isn't it? And then the people also have a problem with someone who's. Um, um, unabashedly like brazen with their wealth they also have a problem with that like someone that's like buying pink Lamborghinis no actually they don't Dan Browserian gets a lot of love that might, that might be the that might be the question there why do people hate Aubrey Marcus but love Dan Browserian or love to hate Dan Browserian what's the reason I mean it's strange isn't it like Dan Browserian that big jack guy that's always on boats with machine guns and, and hot girls and shit and driving cars and tanks and stuff he kind of made a bit of a lie when uh, during that Las Vegas shooting didn't he that he supposedly was trying to no what happened there's a video of him trying to help and some police officer was telling him to get down and not be a hero or some shit um but there's a weird dislike for people like aubrey marcus when essentially i think he's a good dude man i like him i think he's a really good egg in general um what is this i'm saying here uh, da, da, da. oh that's awesome i didn't know chris ryan was on the aubrey marcus podcast. anyway so here's a picture of him just coming out of hospital oh he's in hospital still sorry hopefully you see it on the screen and it's from his Instagram and, it, and the caption reads, uh, got in a big solo car wreck after slamming into a guardrail, but I'm doing okay right now. Lots of stitches, but I'm getting taken care of. The car is a goner. I'm grateful to still be alive and can't wait to get back on my feet to continue being of service to everyone. Love you guys. It's like, Jesus. Looks grim, innit? So he got, he got really banged up, man. Looks like his nose might be broken or some shit. His eyes are all swollen up. Um, he looks like, he kind of looks like how I look like when I got my surgery for, um my um nasal polyps i kind of had this massive fucking thing on the front of my nose and my nose was super inflamed all my eyes puffed up and shit i had to take like four weeks off work i think or something like that like something close to that i was really bunged up i thought i could be back at work at two weeks i thought i'll be fine man I'll, I'll, I'll run it off but i was like really really fucked up um so he looks really fucked and some of the things on reddit on people saying on the internet about you know it's weird that he was involved in solo car accident maybe he was in drugs and shit because it's you know people don't usually crash into guardrails driving on their own it's usually you know maybe intoxication but i doubt it i think it might just it might just be an issue of him just not getting enough sleep he might just stepped on the wheel because that often that often that happens quite often i remember my when i used to drive my dad sometimes and we used to go i don't know cross country to go visit an uncle or some shit and um which were, they were quite good kind of times actually get, being, being in the car with my dad just driving chatting and stuff they were quite fun times but I remember being in a car sometimes and he'd nod off on a wheel and you have to kind of grab the wheel sometimes I'm sure some people have been in the same same situation where you having you quick grab the wheel and work with dad up and shit and then you have to kind of um, persuade him to go into a lay by there's something very machismo about not wanting to st to sit, sit somewhere and rest isn't it but then maybe the actual Maybe you know what I don't. Maybe let's not say that. Maybe it's like you know when you're in the bo you know when you're watching something boring and you want to sleep, but then as soon as you wake walk out, you're not sleepy anymore. It might be the actual driving itself that's making you tired. But then when you stop to try and sleep, you are not sleepy actually. It's just the actual action of it. The fact that the air conditioning is on or you got the heating on, it's making you a bit like sleepy and stuff. All the windows are up. Yeah, I mean, maybe that's the part. Maybe that's the thing that's kind of making you sleepy, but. I do remember being on a motorway sometimes. My dad not enough having to kind of grab the wheel quickly. Um, but yeah, I'm hoping Aubrey Marcus makes a speedy recovery. He's of great service, to everyone. I, I'm a big fan of his. I like him. I'm still, I'm kind of, I'm currently reading his book called On the Day that's available on Audible. Oh, Audible. This podcast actually brought to you by Audible. To claim one free book credit as well as a 30 day free trial, click the link below on this um, description of this video or in the description of the podcast. You'll see a link there. You can get one free book as well as a 30 day free trial. Um, you can get Aubrey Marcus's um, On the Day, which is on there, which is a, a really great day that instead of planning specking out a, a week or a month transformation is basically a 24 hour transformation so he's got everything in there from the morning afternoon to the evening to sleep that kind of involved that you can kind of um use and adapt into your life whether it's meditation whether it's a walk whether it's gym whether it's getting seven hours of sleep whether it's blackout blind he's got some very cool tips in there that can make you live the best optimal life you can also read um Leonardo da vinci by walter isaacson walter isaacson if you're not familiar with is the guy 
that writ the infamous um, autobiography of Steve Jobs before he died. Um, and he's written an amazing kind of unofficial biography of um, Leonardo da Vinci. It really, really gives you an appreciation of just how much of a genius this guy was in an age where, you know, there was no, co he did he couldn't really copy ideas. You know, nowadays where people get annoyed if someone copies something, right? Because there's so much, everything's kind of been done under the sun for the most part, right? So the references, so the kind of, and you know, most people don't, make the effort to bring up any original thought but Leonardo da Vinci lived in an era where you know people were still riding mules and donkeys and he was designing tanks and shit and airplanes you know what I mean like amazing amazing book recommend you check it out so click the link below audible.com forward slash a double g g y that's audible.com forward slash aggie to claim one free book credit and a 30 day free trial anyway so after that the next thing I saw on the list was um ASAP Bari has been cleared of sexual assault Right, so I'm not sure if you're familiar with this story that happened. I think last year was it last year? Was it last year? Should we say last year? Hmm. Let's say last year. Yeah. So supposed to be last year. Um, ASAP Bari. Let's say. Um, I think it might have been during a festival. What festival was it? Do you remember what festival it was? No, I don't remember what festival. It was, but he was accused of sexual assault. At first, everyone was saying it was rape, but it wasn't. But if you're familiar with the story, there was a video going around, circling around on the internet. Um, of a guy that was in a hotel room filming his friend fucking this girl or in bed with a lady and then the kind of camera pans across and then Asa Bari is seen walking into the camera shot he kind of you know heckles those guys in the, in the bed you know te teasing or whatever and then he's kind of says something along the lines of oh you can't be effing with my assistant and not effing with me and kind of like pulls the covers off the, the off the couple that are in the bed the girl kind of screams Bari leave me alone stop it stop it stop it he continues to kind of pester and as she jumps up to run away from him, he kind of slaps her ass or some stuff. I mean, she kind of, you can hear her kind of sobbing as she's running away uh, from the bedroom. Now, the, on, on paper, that looked really grim, right? And everyone was really, really kind of like pissed off about it all and thought this was really creepy. And I think for the most part, even if he probably doesn't want to admit it, I think for the most part, um, ASAP Bari had a bit of a bad reputation anyway on the internet, right? People didn't necessarily like him as a person. You know, loads of rumors were going around that he was lacing people's blunts with PCP. Um, there was that, um, inf you know, just a general back and forth he said with the Encona. People didn't like the fact that Vlon was printing on Gildan. Like, everyone had their fake reasons why people didn't like Bari. But for the most part, I, I was a fan of him, right? Just because as a, as a crew, um, they reminded me a lot of Odd Future and the fact that they were all kind of self sufficient right or self-reliant for the most part and they all knew how to play their position which is what i love too right because it's something that's not common especially nowadays where everyone kind of wants to be a star everyone wants to be the mc you don't really hear of kids having aspirations to be managers or to be agents or to have touring or booking companies everyone kind of wants to be in front of the camera so to have a crew of boys involved in hip-hop which is a typically machismo alpha i'm the one kind of um culture for the most part it kind of promotes that and you know rewards it for the most part if you can be the number one dough you're gonna get most of the fruits do you know what i mean um a la drake but i was happy to see someone a group such as asap um and even our future for um who kind of you know, d disbanded before that who are able to be self-sufficient and have their own lanes right so some of them were modeling some of them were doing like underground rap some of them were styling in the fact in the in the way of like you know um, ASAP Nas and stuff and modeling and all that malarkey. ASAP Ilza's modeling. Um, 12 e raps a little bit and does his brand. Um, last year being broke. Then you've got Ferg. He's got his own sort of lane. Rocky's got his complete sort of different lane. And then Barry had this kind of like cult um, hood brand that was sort of like, it reminded me of like the hood version of True Religion, right? The street version of True Religion. Like he really knows how to kind of like ace that market. You know, people that like to wear like fucked up jeans, low when they're bum showing and uh, little about Dean, little about Dean jacket, you know, like uh, as Playboy Carty said, right? Like that kind of style. He really knew how to kind of ace it. And I really like the logo too. The V reminded me a lot of the kind of baby nape symbol. You know what I mean? It's very, very iconic logo. You can see from afar. Um, the fact that it's a sort of stencil image. I love it. I just love the whole aesthetic behind it. I'm not a fan of the prices. I think it's a bit high, the prices, but you know, for the most part, he does make quite small quantities. A lot of it's all made in the US. Like, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that kind of go into the way he does it. And I like how he drops the stuff. Like some, some most of his limited edition. It's when he sold in a particular window. He does very cool collaborations. Everything kind of works out well. But unfortunately, this also came at a wrong time when he just, I think he just did the Paris runway show, right? That was kind of well received. Um, the one that little peep kind of walked in, RIP. 
So it kind of came at a wrong time. And, and again, like I said, I think he had so much of a weird reputation on the internet that people were quick to jump on this, and especially, you know, during the whole Me Too movement, and kind of try and cancel him and get them the fuck out of here. The story kind of broke, and his initial statement wasn't the best, right? I remember the statement he brought out kind of was like, you know, a little bit dismissive of the furora, of the furora, of the online, whatever that word was, right? Of the online backlash. He was quite dismissive of the online backlash. Like, ah, oh, you know I me, mean? we're friends, we sorted it out, I'm could be behind the scenes, I'll reflect on my actions. But then, you know, reportedly Nike dropped him. But they, I, didn't, I don't think really they make an official statement. Nike did unofficially drop him, which was, you know, hypocritical to say the least. When, you know, if you're in these Nike executives, 10 of them, right? Or 10 or 5 of them left Nike. High-ranking officials in Nike um, were left uh, because they were making the working work environment toxic, which basically means that they were creeping on young girls in the office, which is insane, right? A corporation just as big as Nike had problems with their executives uh, touching up girls in the office. It's like, uh, okay. So, you know, it's a bit hypocritical, you know, double standards and all that. So they kind of unofficially dropped him. But the word around town, now don't take it from me, rumor mill, is that they kind of had to unofficially drop him to kind of save face in public, but they're working with him behind the scenes. So, you know, it's going to be one of those kind of like Louis C.K. things where he will kind of pop up again, hopefully no one remembers. So I think it was one of those kind of attitudes. That's what I've heard, right? They didn't actually drop him. It's sort of like when... Um, Reebok kind of dropped Rick Ross when he kind of made that um, slipper girl and Mickey thing in her line or whatever. Some, you know, I think when he mentioned that thing about slipping a girl MDMA so she doesn't remember anything. So, yeah, um, the case from Bari got dismissed. Um, the story came out the other day. It kind of got a lot of traction, which was nice to see because, again, I'm not sure how real the story is. I don't know what actually happened or what didn't happen. But I am a fan of cases... Um, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of cases being brought to the judge, right? Sexual assault cases not being tried in a court of public opinion. Actually, take it to the judge, go all the way, and then whoever the part, whoever in the party wants to pers- uh, proceed with the charges, then call you proceed. If you can sort out, I'm a complete, then that's fine too. Um, and I'm not even sure if she's the one I even pressed charges. Actually, I don't know what actually happened. I don't know if the the video got out and then someone snitched and sent it to. But can that happen? Can a video? Can you be involved in an assault like that? the video leak someone reported to the police and then you get investigated or does the person that was assaulted have to report you i don't know how that really works out but essentially this case was dropped because the lady in question didn't want to continue pressing charges which is interesting because in that whole era that in that whole time that thing was popping off about this whole sexual assault thing i do remember being a little bit confused why we didn't hear who the girl's name was we didn't see a picture of her I didn't see a picture of her on social media for the most part. I didn't see her come out and say anything. Like, it was quite quiet after it. It was just, like, mostly Bari talking about things indirectly on Instagram or bringing out statements. But it, there wasn't... I didn't really hear anything from her, which made me think that they were actually friends, right? Um, or they did know each other, especially because, like, you know, she was in bed with his assistant. So I'm assuming they did know each other, but it never... In a, but it never got any further, so I'm assuming the girl probably, I don't know, maybe got cold feet, maybe saw the severity of the accusations that she was pinning against Bari, maybe thought it wasn't that big of a deal. I don't know. Do you know what I mean? I'm a little, a little bit, you know, I haven't really made my mind up on the whole thing, but the case itself is quite interesting. I'll read you an article that I'm seeing here on Hip Hop Wired. Um, ASAP Bari, sexual assault case in LA tossed. So many questions, no few answers. Written by Robert Longfellow. Uh, ASAP Barry won't be facing sexual assault charges in LA. The Los Angeles District Attorney announced that he won't be pursuing a case against the designer born Jabari Shelton. Accused, uh, according to the Hollywood Reporter, the DA's office declined to charge Barry because the accuser did not want to continue with the case. Back in November 2017, so it was last year, Barry was sued for sexual assault by the woman. Okay, so he was sued. <clears throat> about a woman seen in the footage that surfaced um, of him forcing removing the sheet from her while she was naked in bed in a London hotel room. It's unclear whether or not Barry is still facing charges in London. Ah, so that... Hold on. Yeah, because that's what happened, isn't it, right? Yeah, I remember that. Um, so, in London, in May 2018, the ASAP mob member was arrested in sexual assault in London while in a lay of Heathrow airport. So, I remember that. So, the case... But it happened... The thing happened in London. I'm pretty sure it happened during a drake tour or something some sort someone was touring here and it happened in a hotel i'm pretty sure it happened in london so this thing happened because the girl had a british accent like barry stop i remember just hearing that and thinking shit that's fucking grim you know when you hear some it's just a bit weird in it but um yeah I do, I do remember being arrested when you had a layover here and then um which is strange i don't know yeah strange in it why, why would he why would he be charged in LA if if the person that he was assaulting was was from the UK? That doesn't really make much sense, does it? I don't understand that one. Um, 
But then I guess if you were, if you, if you, like say, if you, if you have a physically speaking, someone went to London and raped someone and came out to LA, they'll still be arrested, I'm assuming, right? Like, you can't just run away from shit, I'm assuming, right? I would assume, and get deported back or something along those kind of lines. But yeah, so I'm assuming the girl didn't want to continue with the case. You, you know, like, I don't know. I think if you do something fucked up like that and the person's able to forgive you, then I think that's it, innit? You just have to move on. I think the public has to move on and just, like, get over it. Um, it's annoying, don't get me wrong, for some people, because, you know, especially if you've had to suffer it yourself or you feel as if the girl might have been pressured, but we don't know anything. We're not we're not privy to the conversation they have. We don't know what friendship they had before. We don't know if the girl kind of got cold feet because she realised the severity of the situation and that she could essentially, you know, take away this guy's livelihood because of one mistake. Is it a mistake? Is it something that he's always done? I don't know. I'm a little bit on the fence with the whole thing. Um, I, again, like, we don't really know what happened. We don't know the, the circumstances behind it. And I guess the story still has to unfold because it's still the London part of the issue. But I, 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 would, I would stress for some people that are overly invested in these kind of things to maybe take a step back and, you know, work on yourself as opposed to, like, you know, going around and trying to become the social police do you know what I mean for everything else that's going on around the world? I think that sometimes people can sometimes waste a lot of energy on these kind of stories that have nothing to do with them. I know at the time it was very a peculiar situation to be involved in or to kind of like be part of the scene and hear the stuff going on and hearing no one speak about it, right? Same sort of thing with the Aaron Bondarov stuff. Like he was a very important part of the figure of, of Streetwear scene, someone that I kind of miss as well in the scene, but you don't hear anyone speak about him. I'm not sure if he's still got even friends that are kind of looking out for him and being there for him. I hope they are because that must be a lonely time. But there's weird things happen like that in the scene where no one kind of like speaks openly about these kind of things or offers their hand and support. Everyone's kind of private with their shit. But, you know, they're quick to kind of call out other things, which is kind of be annoying. But again, I understand, you know, it's you kind of have to kind of mind your own business in this kind of regard. And I think for the consumer, for the most part, if you have got a big problem with what he done, then I guess you have to vote with your with your wallet and not support the brand. Do you know what I mean? Like if you have a, that much of a, if you have that strong of opinion behind the whole thing, don't buy his clothes. Do you know what I mean? That, that's, that can kind of be your little silent protest in that regard. But I don't think, I don't, yeah, again, it's like, yeah. I don't think people should like concern themselves too much with the actions of others. I think you should um, use it as maybe a barometer to kind of gauge where your moral compass lays, right? If you kind of are a bit put off by it and if you kind of don't like that kind of thing, maybe try it to analyze your own social group and see if you have anyone in your group that could kind of be susceptible to that sort of thing and kind of cut them out of your life. Maybe it's a fact of like making sure you don't get yourself in that kind of situation yourself. But there's lessons to be gleaned from it, but I don't think there's judgment to be put on it because, we, again, we're not privy to conversations. We don't know what happened in that room. We don't know what happened to them privately as well. And, yeah, I guess we still have something. We still have another part of the story when it comes to the London case. Maybe something else might happen. Maybe it might not. We have to wait and see. Um, what else is on the docket? Bumpity bum 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 nice and white. Let's click this. What is this I saw? Oh, this is an article that I saw pop up actually on the BBC um which is interesting again just showing you how different races treated in different countries so a u.s drunk driver suspect tells police she's clean white girl a u.s woman arrested after speeding through a stop sign asks police to let her go because she's a clean and thoroughbred white girl the arresting officer who is white detailed in his official report to now uh how lauren Cutshaw, 32, appealed to him for special treatment based on her race. When asked why, Ms. Cutler replied, you're, you're a cop, you should know what that means. She was arrested on Saturday night and also charged with drug possession. Ms. Cutshaw was pulled over after she drove through a stop sign at 60 miles per hour in Buffalo, South Carolina. As officials began investigating, she argued that she had not she should not be arrested. Ms. Cutshaw told officers that she had perfect grades for her whole life, was a cheerleader and sorority girl, had graduated from a high accredited university, and that her partner was a police officer. According to law enforcement report viewed by a local news report, the official report stated making statements such as these means as a means to justify not being arrested are unusual. In my experience, as a law enforcement officer, and I believe furthermore demonstrated a suspicious level of intoxication. Of course, have you ever been that drunk that you want to kind of, you want to use your race as a kind of get out, get out of jail free card? But that being said, it is quite funny, but to be honest, it does work in course, right? You see that guy, um, what's his name? That Curtis Turner or whatever that guy called, that guy that raped that girl behind a bin um, in LA or something. I got caught and ran away and then um, he got spent like, I don't know, half a term half of his prison term was spent half of his jail time in prison and he kind of got released early 
uh, because I don't know he's like you know he comes from a wealthy family. He was a, I don't know he was, I think he was a top swimmer in that school and shit. Um, sort of like kind of like the affluenza teen. That did, did he did he do a did he do a did he man I think he managed to murder someone in a car accident didn't he the affluenza teen, and then he's him and his mum ran off to an island somewhere. And they got extradi- extradited back home again. It's like fucking crazy story. I think it got released recently as well. So there is something about the American judicial system that kind of rewards wealth, right? Like if you can get the best lawyers, the best prosecutors and shit, you can get off things or kind of get a lighter sentence. <coughs> but there has to be something a bit disconcerting when it happens to police officers, right? In, in your face. I think the police probably don't have that in them, right? For the most part, because, you know, for them, it's, as Joe Rogan mentioned a few times in podcasts, to the police officer, it must still be a game, right? You want to catch as many bad people as possible as you can in a day. So you don't care if it's a pretty white girl or a really gangster looking black dude. You just want to catch bad guys, pe- people doing bad shit, right? So it must be a little bit insulting to have a little a kind of a young girl like that kind of in your face telling you that. But essentially your job is irrelevant because, you know, she, he's, you've gone to all this effort to arrest me, but I'm going to get off on this lightly. You know, reminding you of just where the judicial system sits. But again, I'm not drinking to that extent. It's just fucking insane. I don't get it. It's 2018 and people are still drinking and driving, which just you know goes to show the fallibility of human beings or some human beings for the most part. It's like what the fuck is going on? Um, it's just a very bizarre thing. Like I've I know how fun it is to cycle drunk, right? So that might be a bit of hypocrisy in there. But I also know how unsafe it is too. How how fucking crazy you must look from the back because whenever whenever you're drunk, right? I've tried to do this as a thought experiment, but it's always kind of scary. Whenever you're really drunk, or try and imagine try and imagine what you look like, or step out of your body for a little bit. I try and do it sometimes when I'm in the midst of kind of getting fucked up. I try and like meditate a little bit and kind of force myself to step back and look at myself in third person. And you must look like fucking shit imagine what you must look like like stepping back and looking at yourself like Ugh, who is that guy so um i've not i've never really been a fan <clears throat> in general do you know what i mean of like talking to people that are sober when you're drunk it, let, let alone putting yourself in a car where you might get arrested and someone might pull you over and you might be like hey by the way i'm a clean white girl you shouldn't arrest me please it's like what in the flying f is going on with people a clean thoroughbred white girl, man. Nationalism is fucking nuts, isn't it? It's scary as hell. Again, it's a counter reaction to rampant multiculturalism. Do you know what I mean? Like, um, if everyone opened their gates way too much. It's like it's sort of like you know when you're having a house party and some people you let some strangers in, but then you open it up to everyone and it gets just fucking ridiculous. I think that's what kind of that's what kind of Europe or the world is sort of like had a reaction to. They had this amazing house party. It was like Project X which is a good a good kind of analogy to put on it, right? There was a point in Project X where the party was fucking popping off. Then it just t- took like a little dark turn when stuff, when the wrong kind of people got involved, right? And that goes back to Bergheim and the Berlin. Yeah, bingo. I mentioned Berlin again. Um, <laughs> it goes back to the whole idea behind like the, the, um, the door being the most important part of a club or important part. Or the immigration line, right? Where you let people to come in is the most important part, entry point of your country. Because let let the wrong kind of people in. And then the reaction, common reaction is that you end up with this girl. Thoroughbred white woman. I'm f- I'm a thoroughbred. Don't do this to me, please. It's like, what in the world is going on? Have you seen the other... Um, that, what, that, actually, that Twitter, there's a Twitter account, right? Called... Uh, what's it called? Mug, Mugshot Bays? Mugshot Bays, is it Mugshot Bays? It's super awesome, actually. There we go, Mugshot Bays. I found this the other day um, because obviously this this girl, you know, she's fairly attractive for a blonde Caucasian lady. But this is what, there's a Twitter account called Mugshot Bays that you guys should fucking please follow, right? If you're not seeing this on, tw- if you're not seeing this on um, on the stream on YouTube, then if you listen to this video audio experience, it's twitter.com forward slash Mugshot Bays. So it's spelled M U G. Shot Bay spelled B A E S B A E S yeah mugshot Bay's it's amazing right loads of really hot women that again I don't know how they get hold of these mugshots is it kind of like a public record thing in America when someone gets arrested you can kind of I guess when celebrities get when celebrities when celebrities get arrested the same sort of thing happens to them right but these pictures are fucking awesome look at this look how look they got all these absolute winners that get arrested and you see the kind of crime right failure to appear. 
this lovely looking brunette um this nice latina maintaining a public nuisance a possession of marijuana loads of possession of marijuana by the way you get to see here which is again which makes the whole legalization argument even more stringent because you know some of these girls like like that woman that kim kardashian that um was gr uh, granted leniency to um she got her first time drug offense and she was like in prison for like over a decade or some shit that is insane so you know legalization of marijuana for the most part you know it's, it's the kind of class a drug that most people commonly do take come on legalize this shit these girls don't deserve don't shouldn't be in jail or prison especially if the prison system is going to end up corrupting them and end up doing more crime but most of it is um marijuana position some some what's that word called when you uh prostitute what's the, what's the posh term for it i don't know but anyway pleasure marijuana again another very trusted lady domestic battery nata dui <laughs> Professional marijuana. Loads of girls get DUIs, isn't it? A lot of girls get DUIs. I don't know what that is about. Again, driving with suspended license. This one's an absolute champ. She's fucking hot as fuck. Um, theft of property. Uh, disorderly conduct. Possession of marijuana again. Like, definitely. Honestly, I recommend you check it out. Mugshot Bay is just absolutely insane. Um, <laughs> site you just go check out. I might actually use one of these girls as my cover image on my thing. But some absolute winners. And I think there was a girl on here that got went viral. This kind of girl that had amazing makeup, a black girl. And everyone's kind of trying to get her um, to start a YouTube channel so she can start doing makeup tutorials and whatever. Everyone's kind of getting, a, um, you know, over the moon about her. And I think this might have been where uh, that other dude, you know, that, that black skin dude with the blue eyes kind of got his kind of break from. So, yeah, that's interesting again. Mugshot Bays. Definitely recommend you check that out on Twitter. Lols of incredibly hot women who got arrested for misdemeanors for the most part. Luckily, it's not crazy shit. Most of it is possession of marijuana and stuff. But I recommend you check it out. It's quite funny to see. Just it's just funny as well. At what, at what point? You know, it's that kind of it's that point in the night where you start to realize, oh fuck, I stayed out too long. You know, we all had that moment in life, right? Where you're out, you're getting drunk, you're getting fucked up, you're having a good time. And then something fucked up happens. You might get arrested or what? I don't know. Just something happens, right? And you realize, you know what? I might stay that too long. Like this might have been a day too long or a couple of hours too long. And it always happens sometimes, especially in the days where you are really looking forward to going out and you want it to be the best night of the year. Do you know what I mean? And then it just kind of flies to the sea. Talking about best nights of the year, moving on swiftly on, I'm going to fall this weekend too, which I'm really excited about. Um, I can't fucking wait to go to fold. Is website up yet or not? I don't think it's up yet, but let me check Resident Advisor. Resident Advisor. Resident Advisor Fold. There we go. Is it up? Is the website up yet? I don't think so. Oh, it's up already. Yeah, the website's up, so that's awesome. Wow, it's up. Shit. Okay, let's see this. I haven't, I haven't seen any website yet. This looks amazing, man. Uh, What makes for the community and then submit. Okay, start. What's start? Is that the some form? Okay, do the form, but there's no other information. That looks quite cool. So you see a little bit of the club here, a little bit. You've got these little gritters. I don't know if that's like a window. It kind of reminds me in Bergheim on the panorama bar they've got these bl heavy blinds that they put on the windows that you can kind of open sometimes to get a little bit of light in but they kind of close them so you can't look out which is really cool so you can never you can't tell what what time it is when you're inside um but yeah they've got the cyber website which is nice so you can check out our fold.com i mean fold.london and obviously they've got a site up on they've got a bit section on um resident advisor so i'm going to the opening night on the saturday the 18th i cannot fucking wait it's this one which is ra's pick of the night as well which obviously makes sense I bought tickets ages ago, so it's fold 18th of August from 12 to 12. Bang, bap, 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 bap. It's going to be fucking awesome. I can't wait to go get fucked up. Fold the first dance. Should be awesome. They've got an absolutely deep lineup, actually, they put out here, actually, of, of things that they put in. They've got a night called Whitey's. If, if it's, if it's an all-white all white, white lineup, that would be awesome, too. <laughs> They've got a night called Whitey's. Please let it be an all-white lineup. That would be so funny. But, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. It should be amazing. As I mentioned previously, Fold is the first 24-hour nightclub in London. It's going to be open 24 hours from sun Saturday to Sunday. It should be fucking sick. And I can't wait to check that place out. Fold, we're coming for you. What's next on the docket here? Um, you what, mate? Let's click this. Let's see what this is about. Da, da, da. Oh, Jermaine Pennant. Okay, Jermaine Pennant supposedly got a book out, right? I need to quickly Google this before we talk about this. Let me see. Um, Jermaine Pennant, right? Book. Oh, there we go, yeah. He's got a book out that a lot of people are talking about because I think he revealed loads of CD details about other people in the book. Um, 
So, yeah, I don't know why he's saying all this stuff about people in general, right? I guess this part, you know, maybe it's a thing that he wants to do. But Sabine Pennant, a fairly, you know, fairly average football player, didn't really, uh, didn't really um, fulfill his potential. I say for the most part, and kind of, you know, disappeared into the into dust. Who's he kind of playing for now? Actually, Jermaine Pennant. What's his what was his current club? Jermaine Pennant. Who's he? Who's he play for at the moment? Oh, my nose is fucking leaky still. Current team, Bellarique. He's kind of playing for Bellarique and he's saying all this shit. Anyway, he made a tell-all book everyone's kind of talking about, right? Um, and it's been very, very, very interesting. Um, it's, yeah, there's, he's mentioned that he's had threesomes with Ashley Cole and shit, which I think, you know, you should never kiss and tell, man. Come on, bro. We're bros, man. Don't kiss I'm going to add this to my wish list because I want to buy this later. Actually, let me add it to my basket. That might be a better idea. Let me add it to my Amazon basket because I want to buy this shit later. So Jermaine Pennant's got like a tell-all book, but there was this quote that I saw on on the on Reddit that I thought was really really funny that I kind of want to read out quickly. So Jermaine Pennant, former England international, uh, former Premier League player, who again just kind of one of those players that didn't really actualize his potential, but has kind of sustained a a decent career for the most part and been able to earn some money and not retire and be a shitty pundit on TV, which is, you know, is probably death for most football players, you know what I mean? Because, you know, you don't really care. I guess a lot of football players are a lot like my brothers who play football quite often but don't watch it, which is an interesting, you know, conundrum of a professional athlete, you know what I mean? The, the, the last thing they want to do is spend another two hours watching football, especially if they spend all their time going through tactics, training, working out, you know what I mean? You don't want to spend your free time watching more football. But anyway, this quote says the following. Uh, from Jeremy, Jeremy, uh, Jermaine, Jermaine Pennant's um, autobiography. You get drunk, you talk to every bird, pull one, take her home, and the next day at training, you tell the lads all about it. They ask questions, and you're telling them she was filth. She did this, she loved it. That's what they want. They don't want to be digging in their purses and buying them their own drinks at the bar. They'd rather sit with footballers and get free drinks all night. They're coming over to get drunk and have some fun. They know about you, your profile. They're thinking it'd be nice to have bag a footballer. What they, what they don't, what they don't yet know is that you're literally going to take them home to a hotel, have sex, do all sorts, and probably won't speak to them again. We don't care. And the reality is that we just get, we just want the shag. We used to call it Monopoly. You have your properties, all different standards. You've got my fair, top quality, Old Kent Road. <laughs> the low sand, one no one wants to be there. So we would uh, gauge each girl's property on a Monopoly board. If she was filth and famous, if she was fit and famous, then she's high property worth a lot, possibly Bond Street or Mayfair. Then there, are, there was a girl a lot of the lads had been with, and she would be Old Kent Road. You get the gist. It worked like this. If I stepped with any girl, then any other the lads stepped with her afterwards, they would have, they would have to pay me rent. <laughs> if she was Mayfair, and they would have paid me £100. Old Kent Road, it was one for fourteen pounds I remember one of these lads coming up to me and saying, here's 14 quid. I started laughing and I just went, Old Kent Road. Then out of the blue, one of the lads would say to me, Jay, you owe me some money. And I'd ask why, and he'd say, Lucy, you owe me 20 quid. The number of times Ashley and I had threesomes. He lived in Canary Wharf, and I'd forget the girl's name now. Uh, but we fought, brought her back, and she was just up for it. We were high-fiving each other over her back. Uh, she had, we, had a little tea, we had a little tea break, and then we were at it again. We just, they just don't care. It's like, fuck, man. Jesus Christ. If you're a feminist turn off right now do not read your main penance book man Woo! it's fucking good real shit in it but that's the um, that's the realities right that is the cold heart truth of the matter because nowhere in this nowhere in the story have i heard of him nowhere in this story did i get an inclination of manipulation nowhere in this story am i getting an, a feeling that people are being duped or girls are being told one story, but it's actually another thing. It seems like a very, um, it seems like adults, right, who are very aware of what the situation is. Um, they're very aware of the profile of each of the of said individual, whether it's a footballer or whether it's the lady in question, right? Because the guys know how many bodies the lady has or who step with who. They know her reputation. The girls also know the profile of the player, what colour he plays for, how he likes to get down in parties, if he's generous with his with his cash. They are, they're aware of one or the other, right? So if they if they if they can agree to have this like not consensual, uh, free, loving, um, sexual adventure, 
that is quite degrading to the woman itself, right? It's very degrading, right? For the most part, because, you know, the guys are only involved in her because the guys are currently interested in her because they want to fuck her. As I said, they want to shag, right? And for the most part, the girls are also interested in having a shag. But there is a slight hint that some of the girls, if the guy was willing to take it serious, right, and make them a wifey and kind of hold them down and make them a wag, right, a wife and girlfriend of a footballer, then they'll be very interested. That's the kind of only the side part I see of it in the story. As much as the girls are up for just getting fucked by these random footballers, there also is part of them, I'd assume, that is hoping that the footballer will um, make choose them to be the one, right, to be the mate. But Jesus Christ, what a absolutely blistering fucking story. And I guess that's why it's a bestseller. Everyone's kind of, you know, reading it and taking excerpts about it and talking about it. I think I'm going to actually, I'm going to actually read it and make a reaction video of it on YouTube. Actually, I think that might be the best way to go about it. But again, this is the part of society, of um, sexual interaction between adults that some people don't are, are not willing to talk about. Yes, there is some abuse, I'm assuming. There is some kind of advantage. that There is people that do take advantage of these women in these scenarios. You hear the stories of um, youth teams going abroad and kind of running trains on girls and filming it and shit and putting it out in public which the girl wasn't consenting to and it kind of gets a bit too crazy or when a girl was kind of overly drunk and she's not consenting to something but everyone kind of you know she kind of goes to the flow because she doesn't want to look like she's not up for it there is kind of some horror stories but it is also a part of this there's also another part of the story where girls and boys go out to pacific bars around london where you know you're going to hook up with somebody for non for consensual sex, right? Non-consensual sex, Jesus, sorry, I'll take that back. Where you're going to hook up with somebody with some, for some um, no-strings-attached sex, right? And there is, an, there is an appreciation that if I'm giving you these free drinks, if I'm inviting you to my table, showing you a good time, in, in, introducing you to my um, uh, high-powered friends or very influential friends, friends with a lot of wealth, friends that you could maybe leech off of afterwards because, you know, everyone's leeching, then you are going to give me something in return. It's very crass. It's not something that, you know, a lot of people should be aspiring to, right? Um, it's, dep it's deprived of any sort of morality for the most part. But there are some people out there who don't mind doing this, right? Now, they should be allowed to do it, right? It's sort of like when I got annoyed by feminists getting involved with the whole grid girl stuff and stopping the grid girls from making any money because they thought it was demeaning to girls. It's like, it's just just take in, just, t just mind your own business. There's some girls out there that don't mind parading their wares, their buttockses, their breastuses on the Formula One track in sweltering heat, holding up a placard or holding up someone, a nation's flag, right? Or the flag of the driver or of the team. Some people don't mind doing that. And if they, if they don't mind doing it and their environment that they're working within is respectful, uh, they treat them like equals or they treat them like, you know, any other person in the industry. Um, they're not subject, subjected to constant sexual harassment by creepo guys at their garage and they are comfortable enough to work in there, they earn good money, they're able to support their family, I think it's really offensive that someone can come in and tell you what to do with your own body. Especially somebody that thinks that they have a, um, they have, their morality is better aligned than yours. It's like, what makes you think your, your, um, what makes, what makes these kind of people think that the way they see the world is whatever everyone else sees the world? That's the kind of thing that I hate about it. It's, it's a weird sort of like morality-based arrogance, right? It's really it's really annoying. Like, I find it super annoying because, I again, would I want my daughter to be, you know, looking to shag Jermaine Pennant and his friends, right, and his Bellariki teammates in some shitty bob somewhere, some shitty nightclub somewhere in the middle of Chelmsford? Probably not, right? I don't want that. Like, no one should want that. No one should aspire for their son to be a male gigolo, right? You don't want that to happen. You don't want your son to be a meth addict, right? But if some people want to do things and they choose to do things after constant warnings, you're, you're trying to persuade them not to do stuff, you have to let people go through their thing, right? And if they kind of come out the other side and think, you know what, this isn't the best thing for me to do, I feel a bit bad about this, blah, 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 I want to change, cool, be there for them. But I also think there's, there, should, there should be an, a part of society that should be allowed to you know, do nasty shit, right? Because they're going to do nasty shit anyway. Even if you outlaw it, they'll just do it behind closed doors. And that's the thing that I'm, you know what I mean? It's, I get the feminist rationale behind it because, you know, sometimes they feel as if these kind of things um, uh, weaken the feminist stance and people don't look at us women seriously. Like, how can you um, be empowered by a stripper and also be empowered by a civil rights activist at the same time? I get it, I get it. But Jesus Christ, man, like, 
as grim as the story is, the, the girls seem quite up for it. Have you ever been to these kind of nightclubs where like the girls are kind of parading themselves around like cattle, and the boys are on on on, a, on top of a table, kind of choosing? Sometimes you do it, you get you get the roles reversed. Sometimes you do get some really baller um, girls on tables and stuff like dancing by themselves. Like no, it's just ladies now. We just want to dance with the girls, so they want to get they, they want to get some attention. They want to they want boys to kind of look at them lustfully, but they don't want to be talked to. They don't want to be disturbed, which I understand. I can kind of totally get it. And it's annoying to guys. When there's a table of really attractive girls, they don't want to dance with you. I understand that, but I also appreciate the idea. If you're a girl, you just want to have a, you want, to, you want to be sexy, you want to be appealing to everyone in the club. But you just don't want to be talked to. You don't want to be annoyed and bothered. But for the most part, it is usually guys picking girls. You know what I mean? It's like it's obviously weird. I'm sure someone's made a video of that. Like you know those kind of cattle farm, those kind of cattle markets where the um, the pigs and the cows are walking around the circle in the middle, and the, and the kind of farmers are picking which ones they want to choose and they all kind of I think they all kind of tagged right with their little things on their earlobes and you kind of pick which one you want um that's what most clubs kind of look at some especially in, uh west end nightclubs for the most part you know they're probably the most sexist kind of avenues for the most part. You know what I mean special drinks promotions for girls girls getting free all this sort of shit it's like eesh god almighty but yeah, Jermaine Pennant's book's out now on, on, all, on, all, on all book buying platforms. I'm going to buy it and I'm going to make a video reviewing it. So watch out for that coming up to you very, very soon. Um, it's 56 minutes at the moment. I should probably rattle through some more, but I've got to jump off to work quickly now. But I've got it for sort of, haven't I? Oh, quick one before I leave. Recode and eat uber eats interview a really good interview that i'm going to link into my show description you guys can check it out um recode a, a show presented by sarah swisher she's like a really influential um journalist within silicon valley speaks to some of the most you know prominent figures in the industry she's got a really good interview um with the guy that runs uber eats called jason drogi it's a really cool interview that kind of expounds on some <coughs> topics or insights into Ubi's that I wasn't aware of, um, such as um, McDonald's is kind of, you know, obviously one of Ubi's best customers, and Uber Eats is struggling to get drivers to McDonald's quicker, quickly, quickly enough, quicker than how McDonald's can make the food. McDonald's can make the food quicker than Uber Eats drivers can get arrives at the restaurant, which is fucking insane to see. But if you're in any sort of big metropolitan city and they've got an Uber Eats account, you would have seen drivers just sitting down on the table near the till sometimes, waiting for orders to come in because they come in all the time. So that's interesting um, insight. Um, another intro, intro I, I heard on a podcast was that there's some restaurants or some uh, entrepreneurial restaurateurs who are setting up temp temporary pop-up kitchens for six months or so and running them exclusively through Uber Eats and running kind of like, you know, sort of like a, basically like a cash grab, but also a way to kind of test menus uh, before you kind of launch a brick and mortar store, which is an interesting part of it. I also found that through the interview that um, some restaurants have a Uber, Uber only, Uber Eats only menus because some food doesn't travel well um, via Uber Eats, such as fried food, which is something I didn't really realize because especially if you put fried food in like kind of those old school Chinese metal containers, it can sometimes condense a lot. I know someone when I've ordered like fried king prawn or chicken balls, it can kind of come in a bit muggy because you put them in those kind of containers. Sometimes it helps when they put them in uh, paper bags or like tracing paper bags and kind of let a bit of the air out. So it's fried food doesn't travel well. So some people have Uber Eats only menus. Um, all the pictures are taken by Uber Eats uh, photographers. They kind of fly out and kind of like take pictures for you. Um, another thing I also mentioned that I didn't really know was that some restaurants, in, like, especially some restaurants that you might know of, might have a speciality dishes that they serve that isn't very evident in the name of the restaurant. So maybe it's like, um, I don't know, the restaurant is in the language of whatever um, cuisine that restaurant's from, right? An Iranian restaurant, right? But they predominantly sell pastries, right? And stuff like that. And baked goods or cakes and stuff. So what Uber Eats will suggest to the owners, if they want to listen to Uber, is that they should change the name to be more descriptive. People can know what to buy, know what they're kind of selecting. So they'll change it to like, I don't know, Lucy's Romanian Baked Treats or Lucy's Romanian Pastries, right? And I didn't know that because, I, cause I, cause again, I thought... I didn't know that, but then it kind of did remind me of sometimes whenever I've been on Uber Eats and I've checked, I've checked restaurants within the area, I've been like, oh, I didn't even know this restaurant existed in my area. And I'll click the map and I'll be like, I've walked by that place and I don't know, I haven't seen a restaurant called that. And I remember, oh, yeah, okay. So what they've done is that they've changed the name of, I don't know, some chicken shop around the corner. Instead of calling it Mohammed's, they've changed it to like, I don't know, um, something street chicken shop, right? So it's more descriptive. So you know where the, what it is, what road it is, what area it is, what kind of cuisine it is, which I thought was very interesting. Uh, part of it and they also mentioned something which is very interesting too that they might i think it sounds like 
go into the whole idea of like empowering you know people that are selling food on snapchat and on social media people that do like kind of delivery style like urban kitchens they might kind of venture into that kind of avenue, but I'm not sure how that will work out when it comes to like food licenses and that sort of malarkey. So that might be a stumbling block, but that might be something they're working in towards. And the interviewer did kind of um, trying to press them and see if they were going to open up their own sort of like Uber only, because I think they did a trial run because they're always trying to like figure out the kind of pain points of the app by actually running the things themselves. So they kind of ran a little kind of temporary taco shop thing. And I think the interviewer was kind of pressing to see whether or not they're going to have their own um, restaurants kind of pop up and, and kind of in, kind of like take everything in-house. Sort of similar to what Amazon do, right? How they kind of crush the competition. When you're kind of selling things on Amazon for the most part, you're making a lot of money and something that Amazon hasn't been selling beforehand. They have an internal team that analyzes all the high ticket items and then just kind of uh, brings them in and kind of makes white label, kind of like their own generic kind of like in-house labels. The in-house kind of items are a, a big example and kind of promotes them as number one searches. A good example of that is kind of iPhone cables and other USB cables for other things as well, like Android cables and printer cables and shit. Most of the time when you search for them, you don't get the official ones first. You usually get the kind of like white label Amazon ones first. So the kind of thing, the kind of um, apprehension with Uber East is that they're going to take all these, because they've got amazing amounts of data, right, from people that order stuff through the app. So they're going to take all these kind of insights and then just kind of like take it all in-house and kind of like kill the competition by kind of like refining the best products that they kind of serve. Because imagine if a restaurant's got like a menu of 26 items, but they're only really most, 90% of their profits are coming from 10% of their, of their menu, which is kind of most, how most kind of that kind of ratio works out. Uber could just could basically take that 10% and make that its own menu and kind of take it in-house. But the, but the, the, the owner or well, the guy that kind of runs Uber Eats was kind of adamant that they kind of want Uber Eats to kind of be a discovery platform where people can kind of go and discover different restaurants. You know? They don't want people to, they don't want it to be like a, a, a place to house restaurants within the Uber Eats umbrella, more so like you can eat from different parts of the world through our app as opposed to like eat parcel, eat different parts of the world in our app kind of thing. But again, really interesting interview. If you're a fan of Uber Eats and you use it on the weekends when you're hungover like I do, please check it out. Um, I recommend you'll definitely get a lot of appreciation for the website. I mean, for the app overall in general. So anyway, um, that's a good place to end. We just hit an hour. We just hit the hour mark nice and sharp and hot. I've been coming in strong since this whole goal weekend thing. And this has been really, really something I've been really consistent in doing more so than even the reading and the learning in Spanish. So, yeah, I'll see you guys again tomorrow and again on Wednesday. It's been the Excellence English Show, episode number 93. As always, check out my sponsor at, at audible.com for slash Aggie, audible.com for slash Aggie to claim one free book credit as well as a 30-day free trial. And I'll see you guys again, back again tomorrow for another one of the Excellence English Show. It's been, it's been a pleasure. It's been an absolute blast. I'll see you again tomorrow. Peace.